that's the, I'm just about to record now. So yeah, so as I say, we're, we're doing with David tonight and the main, the main kind of um, focus for tonight is really about looking at, you know, some of the things that you're keen to learn more about and that's about composting, good ways to compost, uh, things about, you know, find out more about uh, plants, pests and diseases and also there will be an opportunity for a Q&A um, session as well. So if you've got a specific question, that you won't answer, David's on hand to, to, to cover that. So I hope you've got your questions at the ready. Um, we can use the chat box if you want to use the chat box, or if you want to put your hand up after David's done an introduction, we can then kind of field the questions as we really have any. Um, so, so that's really where we at, we're at. Is there anything that I haven't covered in the introduction that you want to add? Do you want to add anything in it? You're on mute. That was me busily saying to everybody, could you mute, could you mute when, when David's talking so we don't get any feedback? Yeah. <laughs> but, one, but the other thing I was going to say was, if we could maybe just all take a minute just to say hello mm -hmm. and just see where we've come from or where we're zooming in from, that would be um, that nice. If somebody else just coming in, shall we? Mm -hmm. um, so, Welcome everybody, I'm Enid, um, and thank you so much for coming tonight. I'm sure it's going to be a really interesting evening, and um, that's me. I'm going to hand you over to Ruth, and then Ruth, you can nominate somebody else. Okay, thanks Enid. Um, I'm Ruth McCabe, and my job is to make Fife dementia friendly, and Enid and Jean approached us, and I work with a group of people with younger onset dementia. And we're working in the Grow and Learn in Two projects in the Kennewee Shed and also in the Ecology Centre in Kinghorn. So I'll nominate Audrey because she's one of my group. <coughs> hey, Joe. Hey, how are you? Hi, I'm Audrey. Hi, I'm Audrey. I'm, I live in Methyl with my wee dog called Bouncer and I'm a member of the Sun Early Onset Group. Okay, Liz, would you like to, Elizabeth, you want to, introduce, yeah. Yeah, uh, Liz and Robert, we're from Adderwell Community Council and um, at the moment we're trying to establish a small community garden in Adderwell from scratch. So we're at the very early stages of that. Um, Robert's never been, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we're just, at, sorry. We're just at the early stages of that. Um, kind of wee bit of feedback is something else coming up here on the computer at the moment. Um, a wee bit sound problems. But we're at the moment, um, we've got our cabin in place and our fencing's going up at the moment and we've just got to work on from there. And hopefully it'll be a successful project for our Adewell community. Uh, I'll nominate Colin. I don't know if anybody can hear us. Can you hear us? Can anybody hear us? Yep, I can Don't hear us. Can hear us. Just with Caroline Carr CCM on the screen there for some reason, I'm not just sure why. Did you hear what we said? Okay. Colin, can you unmute? It's down in the bottom left hand side of the screen. Yeah, hello. Hello. Hello, I'm uh, I'm Colin Ainsworth actually. I'm I'm president of the Cali and I was just jumping in just to see what was going on, actually. Jean Welcome. Jean told me about it this evening, uh, this afternoon. So I may not be here for the whole time. Sorry, but, you know, but I just thought I'd jump in and say hello anyway. Thank you so much for coming, that's great. Would you like to nominate someone? <laughs> at, at the moment, no. <laughs> because I don't, I, I don't know a lot about you because I'm very, I'm very, very new to the, uh, the post. Okay. So uh, I, was, uh, I was speaking to Jean this morning and she said that uh, you had a wee uh, masterclass and David Knott would be appearing a bit later. 
and I thought I'd just jump in at the start. As I say, I may not, I may not be able to stay for the whole thing, but I thought I'd just drop in and say hello anyway. That's great. Thank you so much. Right, well, what about Anne-Marie? Hi everyone, I'm Anne-Marie, I'm the Chair of Down Community Meadow. We're a small volunteer group of residents. Um, recently we've taken over um, a small green space within the community and converted it into basically a usable space now. It's uh, becoming a garden, we've got um, a few uh, planting areas, we've put in some nice herbs and things. Uh, not very green-fingered at all, but learning as I go. And I had the absolute pleasure of eating one of my homegrown strawberries last night. And it was delicious. <laughs> so I'm getting there, slowly but surely. Great. <laughs> and I may as well nominate Caroline, who's another member of your group. Hi, I'm Caroline from um, CCM Meadow. I'm a volunteer and currently, as Emily says, we're currently working on a wee bit of green space at the moment. Um, trying to get the kids involved with some of the summer club stuff that we're doing. And obviously, just try to get them to like, help grow and for their future upcoming. Thanks, Caroline. That's great. Pamela? I'm Pamela from um, Grow West Fife, and we're a new. Um, community vegetable growing project near between Curras and uh, King Cardin. So we're growing lots of the vegetables to give, give away and trying to encourage other people to grow vegetables and to eat them. <laughs> yes, good point. Um, I'll nominate Phil. Thanks. Pamela, yeah, I'm Phil, Phil Morris. I'm a development worker in Mayfield at the Development Trust, and we've taken on the pavilion, which is a, an old bowling green pavilion and what was a bowling green is now to be transforming itself into a community garden. So, uh, and uh, out there today, but as I was saying earlier, sort of, so it's nice to have two groups in today. So, uh, from, from a, a, you know, a, a progressive start, we're, we're, we're getting busier even, even now. Um, people are enjoying a bit of fresh air and it's safe, a, safe, a safe space to be. Um, so it's just nice to see people getting really stuck in and, and, and planting the garden and growing veg. And, and likewise, some beautiful strawberries picked today. So it was nice to, to, to see sort of smiles on people's faces whilst they were doing that. So it's it's moving forward and um yeah, it's looking good and hopefully some of our food will go to our new community pantry which is a put a new initiative in, in mayfield which leads me nicely on to nominate sharon because she's my boss and um i'm sure she can talk a little bit about that as well thanks sharon thanks phil hey uh, um, my name's sharon i'm the manager at mayfield east south east development trust um as phil said we have been working for a very long time, I've been in post for seven years and for at least three years before that, we were trying to get the pavilion and green and develop it into a community garden. Um, we had made really small steps, but we got some money from the town centre um, regeneration fund and that refurbished the building. And we got some funding from the Scottish government, which gave us Phil and Phil has developed the garden amazingly uh, uh, every day you go in and there's something else new and it's an amazing time in the garden every week the volunteers come in and there's something completely changed not because we've changed it but because it's grown and it's it's fabulous just now and um, but we are we've got lots of beds it's a very large space and it's quite a well-developed garden now so we we're doing really well touch wood <laughs> that that continues um, so we just started up a wee cafe, so we're hoping that some of our produce could be um, used in the cafe. And by we, I mean we, like very small, uh, won't, maybe 16 people if we're very lucky, uh, all at the same time. Um, and then in the office, which is just over from the pavilion in Green, we've just, um, we're just about to open a new community pantry, which is with an effort to get away from food um, crisis. So trying to break the reliance that some people are, are getting on food banks and we're hoping that some of the produce although most of the food we'll be selling will be ambient foods tins and whatever and um, we are hoping that some of the produce that we make in the garden will go there and will be will be spread around the community great okay thank you so much danny do you want to say hello 
Hi there, uh, my name is Danny McFadden. I'm from um, Eastern Bartonshire, in a, a little village called Waterside. Um, and uh, I'll make Colin feel a bit better. I'm probably the person that knows the least about gardening in this room just now. Um, uh, but I'm interested in it because my wife is very uh, is a very good gardener. She's from kind of farming background and she makes excellent, she's a chef. She's ex she makes excellent meals. And I'm just one of these terrible people that just takes all these things, eats them and everything, but absolutely has no idea how, how it happens. But um, the, the fortunate thing is in Waterside, there's all kinds of little initiatives on, including the wild um, flowers and trees group that goes on. And, and I had hoped Cordy would have been able to join as well. However, she's abandoned me, so <laughs> that makes it even worse for Waterside. Uh, but it's great to be here. I also do a little bit of voluntary work um, with Enid um, regarding CRT Connect. And I've, I've been quite impressed with what Enid has even had to offer in terms of the, all the, the, the plant life and knowledge that she has been creating courses and stuff. So uh, it's nice to hear from you all. And I'm going to pass you over to someone I haven't seen for a while, which is Rab or Robert McKenzie. Thank you. Well, thanks for that, Danny. Nice to see you. Uh, my name's Robert McKenzie. I'm here in High Valleyfield, ex-mining village. I'm the spokesperson for our allotments between Fife Council and the allotment holders. And I'm pleased to say that we've got more raised beds and we involve the nursery since there's primary one and two. And we're getting more and more people interested in our allotments here. We've also created pathways uh, behind the old miners' welfare. Uh, it's now the community club, and there's lots of growing bushes, um, plants, berry bushes, etc. Also, an orchard will be taking place, so it's very, very much active. On that note, I'm a very community activist. I'm an ambassador for the CRT as well. Thank you for good man down, Rob. Thank you. So I think maybe has anyone not spoken? Uh, David, it's your turn. <laughs> I, I, Ina, thank you for that. And I don't know after Dean's introduction whether I recognise myself or not. Um, but can I just thank you all for your, your, your wee stories today? I think that for me, it's I'm always amazed all the work that goes on right across Scotland and your the examples you've spoken about tonight are just so, for me, so humbling and inspirational. So thank you for that. Hopefully what I'm going to say now might make sense and help you later on or whatever, whatever project you're involved in. So I'm going to try and use the technology. If you can't hear me, you'll need to shout out. So let me try and share a screen. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Right, let's see if this works. There we go. So this is, uh, for those of you who know the garden, this is the garden probably maybe two or three weeks ago. And everybody says it's wonderful to see the, the plants and flower. And obviously if you get nice sunny weather as we had in April and as we've had just recently in June, it's great to see, but it's not really any mystery as to how we get good plants because good plants start with a soil. And to get good soil and good healthy soil, what you need is a good composting system. So these are pictures that I took uh, yesterday morning, just showing you all the material that we put. Some of it, the picture on the left is obviously slightly woody. And the picture on the right is probably a picture that many of you recognise, or just some weeds that we've pulled in the garden. Now our composting is on a pretty big scale, as you can imagine. But what we do have, we have a, in our demonstration garden, we've got various bays on a much smaller scale. And I think these are probably more applicable to some of the schemes and projects that I've heard described tonight. So basically what happens is, well, you can see it, you don't really need me to describe it to you. 
the compost comes in on the left hand side and it's given when that's full it's turned on to the next bay so bay one goes into bay two bay two goes into bay three and bay four is what you use so as well as making compost you've got the healthy work of turning the heaps and i'm not i'm sure you've all you're all making your own compost yourself but it's the time and the the, the more material that you can add whether it's woody material or grass clippings to get the heat up it will kill the weed seeds and make a better quality compost so we reckon that in the course of a, a year you know it, and that the other thing is is compost uh, heats up if you you know those of you who make compost in a nice cold winter's day you know you get quite a lot of steam coming out of the, the compost and that's always a good sign because that means it's reaching the right temperature and obviously we try and mix it up as well and you can see that we're not as tidy in some areas of the garden as some people might think we are. So compost goes in bay one, turn to bay two, bay three, and bay four it's used. And this is just some other, these, this is a close up of the material as it goes into the compost. And you can have a pretty good look and see what's there. You can see there's, I don't know if you can see my cursor on the screen, you can see there's small branches, big bits of wood I'll come back onto. But you can see what we've got here. Uh, Bits of wood, there's a few bits of compost. You don't really want a lot of compost soil in the in the heap because it doesn't that really just cools it down. And you can see there's a bit of grass clippings there as well. And then here, just slightly different pile on the same compost, or a slightly different view of the same compost. You can see all the material that's been added. So this is the picture on the left is bay two. And then the picture at the end is bay four, and that's it being used. And you can see they've put some woody material at the bottom just to let the air in. So within a growing season, you can make compost. I would, some people would always say that it's compost, or when you make good compost, it be, should be good enough to eat. But I wouldn't quite go that far, unless you've had your ready had your tea or your dinner this evening. The other thing that you can get in the garden or use in the garden particularly in the autumn, is collect leaves. If you're, if, you're, if you're fortunate to be near a good supply of leaves, but leaves can take a bit longer to rot down and to get good quality or good, well usable leaf mold or compost could probably take 18 months to two years. So it's double the length of time for compost because there's not really the same grain, green material to give you the heat. The other thing that you can do, and it's quite common, and I'm sure some of you are probably already doing it as well, you can make compost tea with comfrey and that can give you you know a dilute liquid feed and you can probably see i don't know if you can see in the back of this picture here these are just comfrey leaves there and that just gives you a feed that's high in nitrogen and if you're wanting to garden organically and i'll come on to that in a bit more detail later on that's something that a lot of people use bits of wood you can make these stockades that are a bit like a what would you say, a, a slightly different version of a bug hotel. And that just gives you, a, hopefully, a home for uh, beneficial insects and invertebrate. Um, and even if you're very lucky, you might even have a few hedgehogs that will keep your, your slugs or snails under control. At this time of year, even in Scotland, um, we sometimes have a bit of an issue with a lack of water. And in particular, if you've got an allotment or if you're not, got any, you're not in a main supply, water conservation can be quite key so you know just quite straightforward things of a couple of water butts the only thing that you sometimes need to watch particularly if you're going to be using a watering can with, with a rose the water you need to put some kind of filter at the top of the downpipe to make sure you're capturing any of the detritus particularly if you get heavy spells of rain uh, and you know you're getting a lot of moss and algae runoff because that'll very quickly fill up your watering can and make your rose quite difficult to to use if you're watering your plants. The other thing that you can do if you've got a plentiful supply of water and you've got a bit of an issue with the runoff of water, and I'll, I'll go into this in a bit more detail, is you can make one of these almost like a, you can use water butts and it just in, in tandem and all that does is really just slow down the flow of the water and it prevents flooding. We've got a much bigger scheme and again I'll come on to that in a wee while and that's something as a climate you know just before the, the talk this evening, we're talking about these record temperatures that are getting in the Pacific Northwest of America. Changes in climate are having a significant impact on us all. Um, 
And again, I'll come on to that in a wee bit more detail further on. And anything that we can do, and the whole sort of theory of tonight is gardening sustainability, sustainably, and how we can all make a difference. So by making this sort of rain gardener, you can slow up the flow and prevent flooding further downstream. And if every, it's a bit like uh, if everybody didn't sort of pave over their front gardens, it would be a lot better. Oh, excuse me. Sorry about that, folks. I thought my phone was on mute. The other thing, obviously, talking about sustainability, is making sure that you're not using peat-based compost. There are some very good, what I would say, bark-based compost that I know there's a bit of an issue just now with, well, maybe you've not experienced it, but we certainly have, with the whole, with everybody growing more plants and pots, you know, supplies of compost can be quite difficult to get sometimes. So try not to use peat in your compost. If you have to use any compost, some of the John Innes compost, the soil-based compost, I know it's quite difficult to get a peat-free version or a peat alternative in the John Innes, but you, you can find them. So try and experiment with peat-free compost if you can. The other big thing that gardeners are very good at is recycling, whether it's repurposing old equipment. You know, this is a big uh, project that we've got. We've, we, you, we, we have these bins are, well, you could fit a couple of people in there if you wanted to get rid of them. But we have these large bins and we have different products we put there in these uh, recycling. And these are, this is an agricultural uh, size bin. So in this one, we've got compost bags and netting. You've got another one for containers. So if you can recycle, and these pots, uh, the group from Mayfield maybe recognise these pots because the gather used to be made there, but I think they've now relocated down to Preston Pans. Um, this is the, the air pot system that's made in Scotland from recycled plastic. And the picture at the top just shows you the, how that, that product works. It just, as soon as the roots come near, there's little holes in the side of the compost. And as soon as the re roots come near the, the, the outside, they just naturally air prune. And that's why they're called air pots. And this is how we grow them in the nursery up off the ground. And that's for plant health reasons. Um, so recycling plastics is quite important. Having said that, you can also use, this is a, a bridge in the rock garden that some of you might know, and you might even know the gentleman that's making it, any of you from Fife, this is Scott Cook, one of our senior horticulturists in the, the rock and alpine area. We made this bridge out of, uh, it was originally made out of wood and it had rotted quite quickly. So we've used uh, plastic wood, and I know that's quite expensive, but we're hoping that we're going to get a considerably longer uh, lifetime out of the, this bridge. The other thing that's a big issue for us is weed control, as I'm sure it is for you. This is us on a big scale. Um, the, the, the container, if you like, is just uh, acetic acid. So if you ever come into the garden first thing in the morning and you smell, the garden smells of vinegar, that's all that is. So if you're, some folk, you know, they come in looking for the, the, the chip shop van or whatever, wander about the garden, but no, it's just acetic acid. But the, 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 the other product that we've been trialing is this uh, hot foam spray. So it's just really, it's, it's this massive machine here that's heated, that heats up the water and there's a coconut oil that's added and you can see the result on the, the right hand side. This is what the, the weed control, but that's on hard surfaces because one of the big challenges I think, and if you go into any supermarket and you see the products now, even the, the products sold as Roundup is no longer a, a chemical, and an unnatural chemical. It's they're now using alternates because they're quite concerned about the runoff into from hard surfaces into water courses. So we, we touched on other impacts of climate change. One of the big pushes that we've had over the last, well, it'll be five years now, is electrification of our hand tools. So moving away from fossil fuels. So this, uh, I don't know if you can see the machine on the left hand side. This is uh, Isaac, our robotic uh, lawnmower named after uh, Isaac Asimov, who was the obviously the science fiction uh, writer that I can remember from my days at school, which wasn't just yesterday. But in the middle there, you can see we've got a wee app on our phones, and it's currently travelled almost as far as Vladivostok. So what's that, about 13,500 kilometres, and it's quite clever. We've got a wee, a wee wire around an area of the garden that would just set the machine going. Unfortunately, or fortunately, it's a great attraction with uh, kids when they're visiting the garden. So all the grass cutting that we do with this machine is now 
programmed to happen at night because it just attracts so much attention from kids, which is a, a good thing and a bad thing, I guess. And then many of you probably use battery operated swimmers in your in your own garden or allotment or project. But we've certainly had a big push to move away from fossil fuel. And the, the advantages are not just to the environment, but obviously to the operator because it's a lot quieter. There's not in this there's not the same hand arm vibration. And as you can see with the headphones in the machine, there's not the same noise as well. So and it, the one downside, I guess, is the initial investment. The batteries are quite expensive, but that technology is improving year on year. So I mentioned some of the impacts of climate change. You know, all the things that we've talked about, and you, you, each of your projects and groups will be well aware. You don't need me to tell you that we've had drier springs, then we get wetter summers, we get very wet winters, and then when it does decide to rain, as we had last year in the thunderstorms late July, August, it rains much more intensely, and that creates problems in itself. Our big challenge, having the four gardens, is to make sure we've got the right plant in the, in, in the right garden, in the right location. And it's, we're using a number of different things to try and mitigate the impacts of climate change. So the use of mulches to conserve water. We need to put in more drains. We need to put in more irrigation. We're trying to harvest rainfall. I've showed you with the, rain, the rainwater uh, capture. And then you've got problems with the fluctuating water table. I always say it's a bit like humans. You know, we can, if it gets cold or wet, you know, we can put on a winter jacket or we can put on a raincoat. Trees, unfortunately, can't do that. And one of the problems that we've had with the fluctuating water table are these pictures like with the cedar there that was just, it was just suffocated at the roots because it was so wet. And you can see that, that problem at the bottom. And then, on, or that tree at the bottom there where it's surrounded by water. And that the need to reduce compaction in large areas. And then the sort of the subsidiary or the secondary problem that we've experienced in recent years is the increase in a number of plant health issues. And I can touch on that a wee bit later on as well. Oh, right now, in fact, no, sorry. So these are these are probably plant health problems on a big scale, uh, much bigger than probably, you know, you might be used to uh, pests and diseases in your veg plot or in your, your plants in the, the project. So we've, we've lost large trees like this. Uh, in the top right through a phytophthora sawborn, that's a similar or a different species that's a, well the same species of affecting the native junipers. The leaves in the middle and the top that don't look very happy, that's another phytophthora. And then the one plant, if you've been traveling around the countryside this year and the ash were very, very late to flush, is ash dieback and that's now beginning to have a significant impact. Other things that we've noticed in recent years is that you can probably see the chestnut in the middle left is this uh, uh, leaf blight. Uh, it's a wee beastie that burrows into the, into the, into, in between the leaves. Um, we've had to put out some traps this year just to try and stop the, the spread. But if you've traveled in Southern England or anywhere, well, probably not for a couple of years now, but you will see that probably by mid, well, mid-summer to, late July, some of the horse chestnuts down south can look particularly sad. Uh, there's a couple of beasties here that we've not got. Uh, the one that's on the American coin, this is emerald ash borer. And if you Google that, you'll see the significant damage that that's caused in ash trees. And I actually thought it was going to be the emerald ash borer that would probably do for our ash trees rather than the, the ash dieback. And then the, the rather large insect in the, in the middle there that's probably the size of, uh, well, what is it? It's probably about two inches long, is a longhorn, citrus longhorn beetle, which bores into the trees. And it can, we've had instances of, we had a member of staff that bought a, a wooden dish from a well known uh, discount store, and he heard this noise, and then this was this large beastie appearing, and that's now been used in a lot of promotional material. But the three pictures right along the bottom are the one, this is the, the plant health issue that's probably the single biggest threat right across the country right now. This is Zyella, and if you've not heard about it, I would suggest you make yourself aware about it, aware of it. It's uh, it's now, it was originally in olive trees in Italy, and it's gradually moved up through Italy, uh, into Spain, and into, or sorry, through France and into Spain, and it is mostly, or has been, a pest of, or a disease of warmer countries, but it is one of its key host species is lavender. So if we get that into this country, 
that will cause us all severe problems. So that's just, that's the, the doom and gloom tonight. How we are countering some of this is we're using, again, we're trying to reduce the number of chemicals. Um, unfortunately, our glass houses have been closed for COVID and we're just closed them now because of a large project. But we use, I don't know if you can see the picture on the top right, we use an awful, or we have for the last four years, been using biological control uh, for many of our pest diseases, uh, particularly pests. Um, when you're introducing this one here is probably a, a wee <laughs> parasitic wasp that you can, uh, for green fly, and, or white fly, sorry, in Carsia formosa. And then even the, on a slightly different scale, even on these big water lilies, we have a bit of a problem with aphids. So we're even re releasing uh, wee beasties to try and control the aphids on the water lilies. And I'm not suggesting you're likely to have a problem on that scale, but biological control for uh, white fly, green fly, uh, even if you're unfortunate to have things like mealybug or even outside for vine weevil, you know, there are drenches of nematodes and or slugs or snails. But I think going back to my point at the start, if you've got a healthy environment, you really probably don't need to use uh, some of these products. But if you unfortunately have a, a plant health issue, I would urgently or strongly urge you to look at biological control. It is a wee bit more expensive, but it is better in the long term for the environment until you are able to uh, retain that balance that all plants require. I mentioned the, the weather previously. This is just rain garden. Well, not just a rain garden, this is a rain garden. This is a, a bigger version of the water butts. So you can see the, the problem in the winter you know, the rainfall in Edinburgh, Edinburgh used to always be considered quite a dry place. We've had probably a 25% 25 in, 25 increase in rainfall. So what we did was we created this area um, by changing the soil, trying to increase the amount of water that area could capture to reduce the flow or the runoff in the water of Leith. We can, you can see the scale that we did it. You know, we added sand, we added grit, we added gravel. We dug the soil, we made a berm, you know, banking along the side to try and capture as much water as possible. We planted it up and that maybe doesn't, you can't maybe see the banking on the left hand side, but that's it planted up. And then you can see we've mulched it with gravel as well. And the whole idea that when we get these heavy rain events, instead of it running straight off and down into the water of Leith, we're able to capture more water. And then if you, uh, that stay in sort of more modern housing schemes will be aware that, you know, in and around the de these developments, you have what they call suds, you know, big aquatic margins that just capture the water as well. So it, you can do the same in your own garden just by sort of trying to, it's, it's this boom and bust, you know, we go from dry spells to wet spells, and it's how you capture the water in between. And I'm sure there's engineers amongst you that can probably come up with quite clever ways to capture as much water, particularly if you're not in the mains and you need to, to water. The other thing that we've been doing quite a lot, and this is this is really, really quite easy to do. You could do this at whatever scale you would like. This is uh, it's a Fife, uh, no, so an Angus-based company, sorry, Scotia Seeds. They have a, this is a, what they call a cornfield annual mix. Um, we, I'll, well, I may as well wash all our dirty washing. We tried to sow uh, this as a, a more of a poppy mix to commemorate the in 1914, the war, but unfortunately, as you can see in this picture, we weren't terribly successful with the poppies. We had more corn marigolds and cornflowers and oxide daisies, and there's maybe, what, half a dozen poppies in this picture. But nevertheless, all we did was we, we, we turned the turf over in the autumn, winter, we raked it down, and then we sowed it, and then that's what the, the net result. And if you go in the garden, We've not really added any fresh seed to this. And if you go in the garden today, it's pretty much that corn marigold that's in flower just now. Much smaller, because it hasn't really enjoyed the dry spell that we had in April um, and, the, and the cold spell as well. Last year, we, we tried something quite different. This is a, sort of like a more modern version. So a very similar, this is, the, the, this is what they call pictorial meadows. This is a a not-for-profit organization based in Sheffield. And this is the, the cornfield annual that I showed you in the last picture, this one. These are native species, and the provenance is quite well known. This one, this, the, these pictorial meadows are more exotic species. And again, you can see the, the difference. And it, it flowers a wee bit later, but 
you might you could potentially argue that it flowers for longer and it is off you know it's floristically more interesting but that's up to the individual and they have a much broader range of uh, seed mixtures in different colors and to suit different uh, you know whether it's a dry a wet a shady or a sunny location again it's quite easy to do you just get bare soil and you just sow it down and it can be quite spectacular this year like many things uh, we haven't re-sown this banking but you can see it it's, it's probably not going to be as good as it was last year and a new bit that we've turned over it was so, so successful last year that we've tried another area and it's I think it's going to be quite good even if I do say so myself and I think there was a wee bit of the, the lady that's in charge of this area, Kirsty Wilson, that's on the Beach Grove, she did a wee bit last year. So if you keep watching it, I'm not sure. I think she's planning to do another bit this year on something similar. So I think this this whole, what would you say, ethos of low low inputs, you know, it's quite easy to do. And then you just sow the seed. And just so long as you can keep it moist, you know, till it germinates and look after it till it gets to this stage. And then if it goes terribly dry, just give it a, a wee drink of water as well. So it's quite a good thing to cover large areas of ground quite quickly and I would say relatively cheaply. The benefits are, you know, it looks reasonably good. And again, that's up to you whether you can decide. You might think it looks terrible. But the other good thing that it does, the, I walked past this area today. It's not quite as far advanced as this, but the bees and the pollinators that were in that were just amazing. So, and then this was a slightly different take. This is a more naturalistic approach. So. What we've done here is we these two squares that you can probably just about make out. What we did was we stripped them back again, and we we used or we we sowed low growing plants that we just altered the height of cut. So not like the either the cornfield annuals or the pictorial meadows, and we've just cut them. And again, you you've got things in here, and you can see the number of pollinators. And the whole idea was to reduce the frequency of the cut. So these, this, this is maybe only cut. You maybe maybe don't or are familiar with uh, No Mo May. Um, well, if my neighbours look at my front garden. I think I never cut the grass, which is true, but that's another story. Um, but it just means that you're not cutting the grass every week. And I know some people take great pride in, the, in how their front garden looks like, and there's absolutely no harm in that. But this was just increase the number of pollinators and the diversity of the soil. This was a wee experiment. It was quite successful, so we've now carried that out into a much, much bigger area. And again, we've just sown that. We had a bit of a problem with the machinery because I think it was about two and a half thousand square meters we're planning and so on. So it'll be hopefully fingers crossed. And if, I don't know if you can see the picture on the left-hand side. That's the uh, that's the side of the the cornfield annuals, and that's probably taken oh maybe two or three weeks ago. The cornfield, the, the corn marigolds weren't just fully out then. The other thing you can do in your garden, if you've got plenty of wood, is, you know, if you've got kids, is you can set up in bought and play areas. This was just some willow weaving that we did. And the, these plants, you think, oh my goodness me, what's going to happen here? But believe it or not, we just stuck the poles to the ground with a pinch bar or a crowbar, and they've all flushed away. The only downside that we've got as you get nearer or further down the slope, it's a bit drier as you go underneath the trees. So it might be something you can consider and it's worth playing around with if you've got a supply of willows or hazels. And they, they, they do root even from these pear sticks. So, and it's great fun to do if you want a winter activity. Um, you've even tweaked ours over the last wee while at a social distance. So that's me almost, well, it is at the end and I've just a wee plug. This is a shameless bit of advertising. You can see that we've got four gardens, obviously Edinburgh and Inverleith, uh, Ben Moore over in Argyll, Logan down in the far southwest, and Doik down in the borders. And I should maybe hold my hand up here. My uh, my family my, on my grandmother's side were originally from Muirkirk in Ayrshire, so I can completely empathise with all the great projects that are going on. So thank you very much for listening. And if anybody's got any questions, so long as they're not too difficult, I'll try and answer them. Now, I'll need, will I try and stop sharing my screen now? Would that be a sensible idea? How's that? Well, I'll have a wee drink of water, thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah.
Jean, do you want to manage the question? I think we've got um, Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I want to pick up on what David said about uh, the chip van and white vinegar um, because we've recently just been introduced to what is Mare's Tail. And, oh, uh, yes, it, it, was, it wasn't there and now I actually I looked at it and I went, oh look, there's Fern popped up. I thought it looked like Fern to me. Uh, and uh, I thought, oh, that's lying quite low. That looks quite nice. I didn't mind it. And then I got told what it was, and, it, and it's seemingly not pleasant, and it'll overtake the small patches that we have. So uh, the only information that I've got to this point is that white vinegar is something good to do with it. So if you can give me any information with that, that would be great, David. I'll try my best, Anne-Marie. So I don't know if Colin's still on the, the call, um, the Cali is involved at Southern Park, and there's. I, I guess the, the question, first question, I would ask you: How did you get the the, the mare's tail into the garden? Did you buy in soil, or do you know how it came into the, the yeah. area? We actually we purchased um, peat-free soil. Aye. Um, we, we mixed it with um, some locally sourced aged horse manure, Aye. and. Basically, just the topsoil that was already there in the ground. Aye. Um, so that's, so that's there was exactly. No sign of it previously. <laughs> that's exactly the same situation at at Saucon. You would have thought the Cali we would have learnt our lesson, but we we bought some. Well, we were given some top quality topsoil. The bonus, if you like, was it was full of mare's tail. So on Sunday morning, there was a group of us spent two hours weeding what we call the winter border because it was absolutely full of equisitum. So what I would suggest you do to get it under control is like any sort of new thing in your garden that you don't want, try and get on top of it right away. Yeah. If you can if you can pull it, you know, just you know, when I say pull it, I would get a, a hand fork or a, a you know a digging fork underneath it and try and get as much of the root out. Now it's a very primitive plant and it's a born survivor. It's full of silica, so it's very difficult to control. So if you want to use anything like vinegar on, you need to really crush it to allow the chemical to be, you know, for it to be up, the, the plant to uptake that. But the only chemicals that I know that control it really, really well are almost what I would say professional. So I don't, you could try vinegar, but I think you might, if you've only got wee areas of it, I would suggest only using you know, the mechanical means, you know, by hand digging it out and get on top of it as quickly as you can because having spent that fun two hours on Sunday morning, it was a nice day, good company, but you don't want to be doing that every Sunday. <laughs> so good luck. Yeah, we're, we're already on top of it, trying to get it under control, but I just thought, was there maybe any sort of natural resources that, you know, would help to keep it? Because, like, the, mm. the root really like spaghetti, then there's lots yep. of them. Well, if you've got as bad as that and it gets really bad, what I would suggest to do is if you can afford to, or you, you've got the time to not cultivate anything in that area, you know, go through it, dig it, you know, you know, pull out as much as you can or remove as much as you can. But obviously don't put it in your compost heap because you'll never really compost that. You really want to, you know, dry it out and burn it. Uh and then see what comes up again. And maybe it sometimes I've seen it take almost like two full growing seasons before you can completely eradicate it. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a born survivor. You know, it, it was around, well, there is an irony here, you know, and you'll, and you'll probably all enjoy this. So when in the Carboniferous era, when the dinosaurs were roaming the planet and that was when the coal seams were all being laid down, the equisitums, that wee equisitum, that horse tail that you've got in your garden, they were probably, you know, the width of, you know, I don't know, a vase, you know, a cup, and they were probably, you know, 10, 15 metres tall. So they were, the help contribute to the, when, the, when obviously the, the, co the, the, the coal was being laid down or the, the what do you call it, the bogs were, you know, the, the, the compressed and that was produced the coal. So some of the coal that we, we, we burned and it probably provided the prosperity for the since industrial revolution was from equisitum, but now you've got a problem in your own project. 
<laughs> well, we are an ex-mining community, Aye. but it's that so bloody it. cat's fault. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there is an irony. But, but certainly have a look at that. And we've we've got currently in one of our glass houses, we've got an equisite of our, our, our mare's tail, a different species, not the one that we've got. Uh, or that we've got a couple of, well, we've got a few species in this country, but the one that we've got from South America, Chile, it's, uh, I don't know if you can see my eye there, it's about that. So your your thing is probably, well, not even the width of a pencil, we've got one that's probably about that size, and it's, you know, it's reached the top of the glass size. So just just think of the coal and equisitum every time you pull it up, or mare still. I just think it could be worse. Aye. <laughs> It could be worse. <laughs> it could be in somebody else's garden. <laughs> Thanks, David. I know. Well, let me know how you get on. I'll be interested to hear how you get on. Well, do. So, thanks, David. We've got Phil. Phil, have you got a question? Yes, it's uh, David. You mentioned about willow. And Hi. Hazel, um, and we, our garden is it, it's sited on an old bowling green. So uh -huh. the bowling green is obviously uh, wasn't designed for for good growing. It was it was as a bowl, but for bowling. Uh, so, but we we've got raised beds in the corner, but we wondered about having some willow or hazel in a sort of small children's area. You want to we want to develop, but it's it's whether it would take in in the grounds there with, with it being because being a bowling green, it obviously it's a compacted sort of uh, material underneath it you know, six inches a foot down, or whether we would have to put in into a border at the edge on the perimeter? Um, well, for, well that, that bit, uh, that picture I showed you, that's probably, is definitely not ideal for growing willow. Um, yeah. You know, it's quite a dry area. Yeah. Probably not too dissimilar from your what you're saying about the bowling green. Um, and what to do is if you can punch through that with a, you know, a spike or a pinch, yeah. and try and get down, you know, you... If you can get it down, you know, obviously, the, depending on the, the material that you've got available to, to make the structures out of, you know, you yep. could probably, and depending on obviously how strong you are, you know, you probably get a pinch down, what, 18 inches, two feet maybe? Yep. And if you can get it down that deep and you do it at the right time of year and it's not too dry, you know, you might be just, it might just need a wee bit more TLC to get started. Okay. But I would, I would certainly, you know. Give it a go. Aye, and just have fun with it. And I think it's, you know, it, it's. It, I was when I was looking at the pictures for the, you know, tonight's blather, if you like, or tonight's talk. It was quite interesting because I'd forgotten just how many folk we had on the structures. And some people are amazingly creative when they start building these structures. Yeah. So I, good luck, and you know, okay. you can you can you can see the structures, um, and you can you you know. You can plagiarise, you can copy everybody else's design. I yep. don't know. Is there any... I'm trying to think where there might be some structures near near the Dalkeith. Yeah. There not, there's none at the, the... What do you call it? The country park, no? The country you know, park. So just I, I, have a, a wee we, sneak in and see what they've got there. If not, I don't, if put that picture that you've got there, or the ones yep. I showed, if you're in the garden at all, um, and unfortunately, we're still doing Trace and Connect, so the, but there's still no yeah. charge. It's up around the uh, Inverleith House. Just going to have okay. a, a, and if you want to catch up, you know, uh, Jean and Enid have got my contact details. I can point you in the right direction and, yeah. and introduce you to the folk that have done it, and they can give you chapter and verse because we, they went and spoke to somebody. So it's it's that's a great way of sharing information. Okay. Excellent. No, nope. thanking you. I uh, no worries. Good luck. Thank you. Any other questions out there? See any hands up? No. Don't see anyone at the moment. David, I've got a question for you. Uh, you touched on Zyella and this business of, um, you know, lavender and all the types of plants that are coming into this country. Um, I, I find it personally quite challenging trying to buy plants and know their provenance and trying to get plants that I know are really going to survive well in my garden and having to, with, without the risk of bringing in sort of like pests and diseases, local pests and diseases, but I'm very aware when I go to nurseries, I look at plants and I think, where have you come from? 
Um, and I just wondered, what's the kind of take the botanics are, um, what's their approach when they have to look at new plants and how, how do you ensure that you're doing that as sustainably as possible? Um, well, we, we are probably, well, two, two different angles to that, Jean, in that we are obviously, we're not undertaking any field work overseas just now, but the, the, mean, the, the one way of reducing the, or the, the least impactful and least probably susceptible plant health issues is grow red from seed. And what I would say to anybody in the project, you know, I think the, the, the cheapest and easiest way, if you've got the, what would you say, the, the ability and the technical skills, you can raise a tremendous number of plants from seed quite quickly. And the good thing is if you've got a surplus of plants, you can either swap them with other groups or, or if you're, I don't know whether you, you run plant sales and if you can you can sell plants, you know, quite quickly if they're provided they're well grown. And I think it's, with, with community groups, it's a fantastic way if you've got a, what would you say, a, if you've got a lot of uh, volunteer help at particular times, you know, you can, you can prick out or pot up a great number of plants if you've got the compost and the pots and then you can have a, a sort of recycle scheme so if you you can bring the pots back and get them filled up the next year but seed I think would be the safest way and I think the one thing that we've perhaps all learned under well, over the last what 14 15 months is that we that sort of self-reliance and I think we're kind of turning the clock back a wee bit in that we need to be more reliant on ourselves rather than you know going down to the garden center or you know, the supermarket and just buying plants, you know, you'd really need, you get more, plus you get more satisfaction. If you've got the time and the inclination to grow plants from seed, I would recommend that. But not everybody has that. And that's why, you know, instant gardening, going to the, the garden centre or the supermarket and just buying something that's in flower. The one thing that we found this year, uh, not even a plant health issue, you know, a lot of the, the garden centres and the the supermarkets were selling plants in April and then we had that run of what, 18 nights of air frost and then it was likely to perhaps survive in previous years, had no chance of surviving this year. So I think we, we do need to garden more sustainably, you know, from a plant health perspective, but I think we need to also enjoy it as well. Plus there is the cost as well, you know, for a packet seed in the compost, you know, you can get probably a thousand times more plants than you would do if buying them. But it's just time, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Do we have to think about the kind of seeds that we're buying as well? Is there any issues in really just buying from re reputable suppliers? Is that the best way? Well, if you're, you know, remember you're talking to a Scotsman. The other thing that you can seriously consider, and the, you, you, I'm, I'm closing my own ears at this point, you know, all plants produce seeds. And if you know what you're looking for, you can collect seeds even from, uh, you know, friends, gardens, have a look around. And, you know, we've, a wee poke of seeds, you know, you can get a fair fair amount of plants quite quickly. And there's a lot of seed exchanges as well. If you're looking for something a wee bit out of the ordinary, you know, if you're growing vegetables and you want heritage varieties or organic varieties, but I know this year, because everybody's, you know, now enjoying horticulture, gardening, and growing plants from seed, you know, seeds are kind of short supply. And, I, you know, I, I know the, the, the you know, the, the nearest I get to seeds probably is, you know, the supermarkets these days. Uh, and they've just flown off the shelf. And it's a great thing to see. And I think that's something that we should encourage. So yeah, aye, seeds, seeds, seeds. That would be my, that would be my suggestion. But it doesn't cost any money either, or as little, it will cost a bit of money. And it's the only exception we'd make is if you're going to think, if you're going veg, you know, you can either go F1 route and you, you know, you, but you might then end up with glut and that might help uh, fill and the cafe at, Dalkeith, could you might have then have a, you know, you'd be able to plan when your 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 production of vegetables is, because I know that's something that some of my colleagues do in the market garden, in the garden in Edinburgh. You know, they have a, a cropping calendar that they're able to predict more easily with F ones, but that's not for everybody. You know, if you're growing them, you might not want F ones, and then you've got a, a, a longer cropping period. Great, that's that's great advice. Thanks, David. I've got a question from Enid. Um, how should she deal with her flatworms? What should she do with them? A uh, couple of bricks and squash them. <laughs> but don't don't put them on your sandwich, Enid. Um, no, seriously, the best way to get it a get a a bin bag or a compost bag. Just lay it down, a couple of you know bits of wood, and the the 
the flatworms tend to congregate underneath that. And that probably picks up on your previous point, Gene, about bringing plants in, because obviously when you're looking for pest diseases on the on plants, you're looking at the upper portion of the plants. You're not looking at what's in the soil. So when you, you know, as a matter of course, any plant material we bring into the garden, we tend to put it in isolation for a, a growing season. And it might be something that if you're bringing new plant material to any of the projects, it might be worthwhile considering that. But obviously, that's another time and money issue. But uh, yeah, so control and flatworm, bit of a polythene, put it down, shady part of the garden, and they'll congregate underneath there. And then make sure you squash them quite thoroughly. There's no other way of getting around it. Do you have to record where if you if you have a flatworm in your garden, is it a good practice to do that to to, to notify? Um... Well, I think anything. Well, it's funny enough. I was in, in a meeting today, and that was the whole issue of biological recording came up. I think anything you can do to record information. You know, it's like uh, unfortunately the last couple of times I've recorded anything like that has been roadkill and badgers on the side of the road. Um, so it, it all builds up a picture of the distribution of these these pests. And the other one that's probably creeping up through the country, they're just thinking of recording things, is uh, lily beetle that some of you may or may not, and you kind of really miss it because it is bright red. Um, so, yeah, anything like that. There's I record. there's various. Last year, what was it? I, I put a record in it. It was a new county record in my front, from a front garden in the long grass that I don't cut off. A, what was that? It was a beetle as well. So, so it all just builds up the picture. Thanks for that. I'll I'll get someone else to do the squashing. <laughs> I just watch your fingers at the same time, you know. I used to have chickens and they ate them. <laughs> aye, aye. Chickens are good, and that says just that whole ecosystem approach again. So thanks for that. Any any other questions before we? I don't know if anyone else has got the hand up. Any other questions you can. Now's your chance to get David to answer your... Has Avril got her hand up? Uh-huh. Avril, hi. Hi, David. Um, we're um, trying to establish a wee community garden and we've got a bit of space up towards the back. We were going to plant fruit trees, um, but we've been told we weren't allowed to do that anymore. So we were thinking about um, trying to raise our own plants with seeds, veg, fruit and veg. And we were just wondering what was the best way to do this. Should we maybe try and get a wee polytunnel, cold frames, or a wee greenhouse? What do you think would be the best? Well, it really depends how much money you've got. You know, if, if you if you had, obviously, if you started at the top, greenhouse, and then a polytunnel, <clears throat> and then probably cold frames, but you can get equally good results. I think a lot depends on how skilled you are and how much time and effort. Obviously... Uh -huh. Uh, don't take this the wrong way. If you've got cold frames, obviously you're going to have to bend over, so it's maybe no terribly great uh -huh. in the back. Uh -huh. uh, if you've got polytunnels, you can maybe put a bit of staging in. And the other thing that you could do, uh, well, certainly you could probably work out there in the wet, uh, you uh -huh. know, because it's not always dry and sunny as it is, mm. has been today. So it really just depends. But I think, you know, polytunnels are probably, you know, what were you looking at? You know, obviously, depending on how many plants, you know, greenhouse, you know, you, you know, it's on a sliding scale of cost. But the, there might be grants available. You know, I'm not sure. I don't want to step on anybody's toes. But there, I'm always amazed at how community groups are able to extract money from little projects just for things like you're saying. And, mm -hmm. and going back to Jean's question, you know, if you can grow, you know, your own, you know, veg, mm -hmm. oils, plants, you know, from seed quite easily, and you can, you've, the only thing I would say is, I'm always, it's a bit, it's a bit like Topsy. You, you know, you sow a wee, a wee pot with seed and then before you know it, you fill your whole greenhouse just with the, you know, what you've, you've pricked out or, or planted out or moved on. So, a, you know, a, a large tunnel, well, not a large tunnel, but a tunnel uh, would probably be quite a good idea. And you'd, I'm not sure how many is in your group or project, but you'd be able to probably keep it even, you know, at social distance, you'd be able to keep, a lot of people occupied, you know, even in the, the, the worst of days. And, you know, you could you could sow the seed and just have a conveyor belt on. Mm -hmm. And the good thing about a tunnel, you know, I know the, the wee tunnel that we've got in our market garden, they've put raised beds in that, and they're able, mm -hmm. in one half of that tunnel, to more or less have uh, salad crops 
or, or green crops all the year round just by giving it that overhead protect, protection. It was maybe a bit of a struggle this year in January and February, but they were still able to keep things going. So, yeah, I would if, if it was me, you know, get a tunnel, but maybe if you can if you can afford it, get the ones with the wind-up side so you've got a bit of air movement yeah. so it doesn't get as warm. Mm-hmm. Uh, glass houses, you know, if, if you maybe want to have a, a wee thing, because you could, you could use a glass house and you could, if you could afford to, you know, even just, take a bit of heat you know you could start things a bit earlier and then you could move them into the tunnel and then you can harden them off in the cold frame so you know so you've got a production line yes. and it's just the way that we always used to grow uh veg in scotland you know you've got that conveyor belt of temperatures and then before you know it you're planting stuff out just that wee bit early and if you can plant stuff out that wee bit early you know it's a bit like uh uh, the lady that's mentioned about the strawberry once you've once you've tasted your first successful whether it's a, <laughs> I don't know a, a radish or a lettuce nothing will ever taste the same again mm-hmm. I can agree with that <laughs> <laughs> does that kind well, of answer actually, the well I'm actually the strawberries hopefully we get in there we've had one off it so far but the birds have had to put the netting over them now because the birds have started on them so basically we'll go there's a lot, there's a lot more strawberries this year than there was last year so Looking yeah. forward to them, and I've ate all my radishes so far, so I've enjoyed the way. Good, good. Thanks for good that, luck. David. I'll be interested to know how you get on. Uh-huh. I'll let you know. <laughs> so, probably just time for one more question. If there's any more, any more questions from anybody? We're just a wee bit over the half past. Um, no, don't see any. I was just gonna gonna say um, we just to chip in on the polytunnel um side of things we we got one this year and with funding with really generous funding from crt and um it's been um, i mean we're doing i think we're doing really well <laughs> none of us ever ever used a polytunnel before and it's just um it's it's really great just to watch the difference of you know the way things just sort of shoot up and you know, really happy and singing along in the in the polytunnel. Whereas, you know, because of some of the weather problems sort of earlier mm. on, things on outside have just been so slow. Mm. Um, so I don't know, I think it's good. I think it's going to be, I mean, we haven't had any, I know people, we, we will face problems in a polytunnel as well. But, oh, so far it's just been a joy once we got the thing up, which took, you know, a bunch of people... <laughs> about the well i hate to say this but a bunch of men in our group who said let's all get together on a friday afternoon and just put this polytunnel up three weeks later when eventually somebody did look at the instructions they've got it up <laughs> and, it, and it's been great it's been great but um yeah <laughs> is that i know pam is it <laughs> what's that is that team now for hire? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't hire them out. <laughs> um, yeah, but no, I would re- it's, it's great. And like you say, James, on a cold, wet day, just sit in there and do some seeding. It's great. <laughs> well, there you go. That's, that's, that probably answers Avril's question right away. Yeah, and keep a little bit of a social, we've got, not a social area, but we've got room for, you know, a table, a little table and chairs where people can just sit in there and have a cup of tea. And yeah, and we've made ours, ours is big enough to have, you know, quite a few people in socially distanced. So, yeah. If you want to know any more about our experience, then just send me a message. The truth of Pam's garden is every time you go up, there's another couple of chairs arrived. <laughs> oh, I know. We've, we've got very good at sort of upcy- upcycling every bench going in five. <laughs> They're all in our garden. <laughs> so I don't know if people have got time to wait for another five minutes, but we were going to have Lee Brown giving us a little rundown on what's happening at the Ecology Centre in Fife with the, with the stand group, but he couldn't make it this evening. But Ruth has offered to say a few words about it. Would you like to just finish off the the season with with a wee bit of an experience? Folks, the um, I mean, the ecology centres at Kinghorn. It's been there, I think, for about ten years. 
but they've got polytunnels and they've been growing quite a lot of different things. So the stand group have been going there on a Thursday afternoon. Um, our group is quite large, so we've had to split ourselves in two just to manage the numbers with the COVID restrictions. So half of the group go to the ecology centre at Kinghorn and half go to um, the shed at Kennaway. So the ecology centre, we've been doing things like pricking out and stuff. Um, there's been all sorts of vegetables planted. We've been planting bulbs and things. They've grown pretty much everything from seeds. So they're doing really, really well. It's a well-established site. Um, so we're really enjoying being there. Audrey and Yvonne, who are on the call uh, from stand tonight, um, they've been working more at the um, shed in Kennaway. Yvonne is our master weeder, um, and I think we'll have to get one of these uh, machines for Yvonne, because she's doing amazingly. She'll weed, and she just loves it. So she's a huge asset. So for the lady who's got the problem with the thing, the, the mare's tail or whatever she called it, we'll send Yvonne over to, to you and get her to dig that out for you. Um, but the shed at Kennaway's, Basically, they've got, I think it's 55 allotments that the local people use. And then Bob's got his big polytunnel where he's growing stuff and he's given our group two raised beds. So we're really just, and I don't know that Audrey and uh, Yvonne are fabulous gardeners. I'm not at all. So we're very much learning as we go along. So but Audrey, what do you like? What do you think of the shed? Um, I like going and I'm so excited because we planted beetroot and I could actually see it growing and we <laughs> planted onions and we could see them starting to grow and we're going to grow carrots and sweet and all different things and uh, yeah, it's, it's great because they have bees as well at the shed. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, so they've got a bit of everything and yeah, so I'm learning quick. <laughs> <laughs> And Yvonne, how are you with the weeding? I like doing that. <laughs> oh, you do, you're amazing, yeah. Our biggest problem has been watering um, because it's been so dry and we have got to allocate people to water the beds. So they're going up, they've got a wee rota going sort of three times a week, people are going along. So that makes all the difference actually because we were surprised obviously when it was so dry. Um, I think our biggest problem is the soil at the Kennaway Shed's not fabulous. So I think we might have to get some of the compost or something on that at some point because it's pretty, I think it's quite rubbly. Um, but anyway, we're all enjoying it and thankfully the weather's been half decent. Uh, so we've been able to get out. So yeah, but we must come and visit yourself, Pamela. If you're in High Valley Field, I didn't know you existed. So it's amazing when you come on these calls. Um, so that we'll come along and have a wee visit with you. That would be good. Yeah. Anytime. You can come and visit us. Yeah. Mm. We're always I'd love to I'd love to visit you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that would be nice. We'll do that. <laughs> I think there's nothing better than visiting someone else's. Yeah, place. definitely. Definitely. Really good. Okay. So any uh, last minute yeah. desire to share something wind up for the evening? No. The, the, the only thing that I'd like to share, you know, is um, just to thank everybody for coming tonight, but just to alert you to our next speaker before I thank David for joining us. But we've got, um, you know, we've got a programme of masterclasses um, organised over the, the months ahead. So we've, we're lucky we've got Jim McCall for our next speaker. Um, and that's going to be, the, I'll send out an email to you all, but that's going to be Tuesday the 20th of July. And that'll be between two and three o'clock. So no doubt you'll want to tune into that one. Um, Jim's going to come and talk about getting back to basics. He's fed up with all the fancy Dan gardening that's going on out there and he wants to get back to basics. And he's going to tie that into a lot of what David's chatted about tonight, the, the whole impact of climate change is how it's made such huge, huge difference to us as gardeners. So he just wants to get back to basics and I'm sure he'll have um, lots of um, good advice to give us. So have a wee think before the session, if there's things that you specifically want to ask Jim, he'll obviously answer any questions for you, but uh, that, that's, our, that's our next masterclass um, that we've got programmed. So it's shaping up really well. Um, we've got others throughout the, the, the months ahead and you probably have that programme already, but we've just confirmed when, when Jim was going to be joining us. So, so that's, that's one for your diary. But um, I mean, I would really like to just thank David for coming along tonight, David. That was really in, 
uh, interesting, really insightful. Thank you so much. And it was great just to see what happens in the botanics. And I think we're all going away with things tonight that we can do in our little plots. There's a, the, the, the amount of knowledge and expertise. And for me, I think just seeing in particular the compost system that you've got, that's a really a great system. I've used that in the past and I would really recommend that and especially with the slats at the front. Great system there and if you want to, I mean, go along to the botanics and see it firsthand, you know, what they're doing there because um, uh, you'll learn so much. But thank you, David, for pulling that together tonight. It's been really, really interesting um, and uh, sharing, sharing all your expertise. It's been great and uh, giving us all hints and tips as to how to garden more sustainably. Um, and uh, so, and again, just thanks everyone, everyone else for coming along. Enid, I don't know if there's anything that I haven't said that I should say, anything else that we should think about? No, I've just ditto and thanks David very much. It's been a real pleasure to meet you and hopefully next time I'm passing the Edinburgh Botanics I can pop in and say hello. Hi, I look forward to that. I'll, I'll extend that invitation to anybody here. Everybody on the call tonight, if you see me and you're in the garden, just shout out and you remember, just remind me that, you know, I might look a bit vacant, but uh, please make yourself known because it's it's been for myself, as I said right at the start, it's a humbling and inspirational experience listening to all the projects tonight. So I'll be interested to hear how you're getting on either via yourselves, via Enid or Jean. So good luck with all the projects and great to meet you tonight. And thanks very much for allowing me to speak to you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thanks everyone for coming and I look forward to seeing you again soon. And maybe we can start to think about now that things are freeing up a little bit, you know, once we get into August even better, you know, how we can maybe organise some some trips. Maybe we'll get a mini mm. bus or something and go on tour. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Can, can we have t-shirts? Can we have two t-shirts? <laughs> <laughs> <It's a> t -shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> right. Okay, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks so Thank much. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.